And once we came out of that meeting, uh, I realized that we, I think we had something because what they said was, listen, most times a technology company will just build something and ask for forgiveness later. But the fact that you guys are bringing us in as partners, you know, you can utilize our test track. You're listening to Caffeinated with host Nathan Resnick, the show where we help companies level up their customer service to turn this expense into a profit center so you can increase revenue and drive customer happiness. Hey, welcome back to Caffeinated. My name is Nathan Resnick, and today we're joined by Neville, who founded Reviver. This is one of the coolest businesses we've had on Caffeinated. Neville, thanks so much for joining us. Nathan, thanks so much for reaching out. This is an absolute pleasure. So before we dive in, the first question I always ask is, what kind of coffee do you drink? Okay, so it's it's black. I put okay. nothing in it. I there we go. Easy. So okay, yeah, I up. love I love drip coffee. Um, you know, I'm a fan of blue a blue bottle. So um, just gotta say that throw, throw yeah. out a little bit love there. But yeah, yeah I'm, I'm I'm all about the drip, man. Okay, cool. And, and before we dive into customer service, I want to get, you know, just a glimpse into your backstory, 30 seconds, you know, how did you get started? Tell us, you know, more about yourself. Sure. Um, I went to Cal. Um, my my uh, focus was um, basically poli sci in business. Um, I, I expected to become an attorney, uh, but, you know, I got fascinated by a couple different things, had a good friend that we started a business together um, that was marketing focused. So I was doing events for the Oscars, Grammys, uh, clients like Pepsi, Microsoft, Moet Hennessy, you know, along those lines. Uh, 2008 hits, uh, and I realized that, you know, the whole world is changing, the economy is crashing around me. And I had a good friend in San Francisco that I was having dinner with, uh, and he worked in state government for about, you know, 10 years. And we were talking about underutilized assets that the state owned. And um, lucky for me, unfortunate for him, he had gone to the DMV, had a horrible experience, and we were having that conversation. And, you know, we started talking about, you know, what about license plates? And because license plates were one thing that were controlled by the state and not by the auto manufacturers. And every year, regardless of what was going on, you had to renew them. So if you could actually improve the process and make it easier for people to utilize, then we thought that there was a business there. So we were able to get a meeting with a guy named Dennis Clare that worked for the DMV, uh, California DMV. And what I thought was going to be a five minute meeting ended up being an hour and a half because they were wanting to go more online. So it's just timing like anything else. Yeah. Uh, we met with their counter- his counterpart, the California Highway Patrol. And once we came out of that meeting, uh, I realized that we I think we had something because what they said was, listen, most times a technology company will just build something and ask for forgiveness later. But the fact that you guys are bringing us in as partners you know, you can utilize our test track. So it was just that different experience because we brought them in as part of the process instead of acting like they were an impediment. So my big thing is is that it's all about partnerships, man. You bring people in, you partner with them, and you, you know, you build things together. Totally. That's awesome. I love that. And it sounds like too, I mean, as we dive more into your support team, you're supporting kind of different parties within your business, right? Because you have the end customer that's actually the, you know, person that has the car with the license plate, you've got then, you know, governments, and then it sounds yep. like, I don't know if you deal with, you know, manufacturing fleet. and all of that. Yeah, but- manufacturing partners, absolutely. Um, you know, fleet customers that we work with and, you know, um, just kind of across the board and dealerships got are it. another uh, partner that we have. So it's, it's all about realizing you know, who, who you should be partnering with, mm-hmm. being smart about it, uh, you know, holding up your end of the bargain and making sure that people are taken care of. Makes because sense. when you talk about customer service, that's everything. Totally. Because that's who you are. That's mm-hmm. part of your DNA. Right. And you taking care of people and improving their lives in some small way mm-hmm. is, is a win. Got it. Yeah, hundred percent. And and how big is your organization in terms of headcount, and and how many of those people are, are focused on support? Um, from a headcount perspective, we're close to seventy people. 
Um, our headquarters is in Granite Bay. Uh, and it, um, and then when it comes to support, we probably have uh, between um, the folks that we work with, that we outsource, and the people that are in the office, probably 25 folks. Makes sense. And, and how are those... 25 folks structured, right? What does your support team structure actually look like? Are there certain people that handle a chat or certain people that handle over the phone or certain people that only handle dealerships? I mean, what is that structure within that? Yeah, it, it's broken up. So it's, it, you know, we, we have an overall team lead that, you know, kind of manages our, you know, functionary team that, you know, deals with, you know, level one customer support. Uh, we have a team that deals with dealerships, you know, directly that deal with fleet directly. Um, and then we have, you know, a group that, you know, an escalation point so that if there are, you know, additional issues that come up, we've got a group that actually deals with that as well. Got it. Makes sense. And then what, what kind of are the main metrics that you track? Is it, you know, do you get as granular as response times and average time response and kind of number of tickets that a rep handles per month? I mean, do you dive into the detailed metrics around that? Yeah, we, we definitely do. And then that's, and that's, you know, vitally important for us uh, to make sure that we're taking care of everybody. I mean, you know, that is always something that you can be improving upon and you, you want to set up metrics for success across the board uh, to make sure that, you know, we're taking care of folks the proper way. And if there are issues that pop up, uh, be willing to, you know, fall on the sword and say, hey, we could have done better and then work to improve it. Right. right. Yeah. And, and you mentioned too outsourcing. So, Walk us through the, the, the decision to outsource. I mean, we see quite a fine split of businesses that, you know, decided to support all in house versus outsourcing. I think there's positive and, and negatives to both. I mean, what there, kind of there is, there, we, we looked at it, you know, from a cost benefit perspective, but also um, for, you know, making sure that people were, were getting back to folks in a timely manner. Right. Um, and, um, and then also looking at ways to make sure that the experience is, is seamless. Mm -hmm. And I'll be honest with you, we've got, you know, a lot of work to do because that's something that I don't think you ever start working on or, you know, trying to refine. And that's something that is vitally important to us, you know, as a company uh, to make sure that we get right. Right. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. And with that outsource team, are they, are they you know, in the Philippines, Mexico, or kind of where, where are they? No, this, uh, our, our team is in Mexico um, now that we cool. use. Um, and, you know, so it's, it's, a, it's a split between who we have in office that right. supports right. and then those that are, you know, um, you know, in Mexico. Totally makes sense. And what kind of key software do you use? And have you switched softwares over the years? Because I know you've been, you know, running this business, I think, for over 10 years now, right? Um, from a software perspective, we're, you know, we're working with, um, you know, some folks from AWS on, on their software okay. um, to help streamline some of the processes that, that we're using. Our okay. IT team has been, you know, really involved in helping to streamline that. And Got the it. folks from AWS have just been excellent to work with. Got it. That's awesome. And, and in terms of kind of, you know, what's trending right now in terms of AI, right? You know, you see so many businesses trying to utilize AI with different functions. Have you guys explored using AI, you know, from a support function? We've explored, yeah, we, we've explored it to a certain extent, and I think it's going to always be a combination of a mix. Uh, mm -hmm. People get really frustrated when they cannot talk to a live person. Right. Um, I think that there is something right. to be said for that. You want to have and put together prompts that allow you to uh, make it easier for people to communicate. Mm -hmm. uh, we have folks on the team that use chat. Uh, to help as another way, an outlet to, you know, get to somebody and right. help to streamline that process. Mm -hmm. But um, I think there's always going to be a combination of, you know, looking at the newest technology, you know, AI, uh, also, you know, dealing with chat and then also, you know, working the phones. I totally. think it's all part of it. Yeah. I mean, one question that a lot of businesses get is when should they start phone support, right? And, and when did you guys make the decision to enable customers to, you know, call into your support team? And, you know, because most people only well, have email and chat, right? Yeah, no, um, we've been doing that from the beginning. There was a time that we we had to stop because we, we needed to fine tune some items. Mm -hmm. uh, but we've, we've opened up those lines again. And it's, you know, and it's important for people to be able to get in touch with us. Totally. Um, just there's something about when you feel like you have an issue, 
that is more important than, you know, you know, dealing with AI or dealing with chat or email, that there's the need to actually talk to a live person. So totally, totally. It makes a lot of sense. And I'm curious, switching gears here a little bit now, so many of our listeners ask about how do you sell into a government, right? And you work with the DMV at some of the largest states in the country. And so, I mean, can you tell us a story of how do you first off approach even a DMV to, to work with you? And then what does that sales cycle look like? Okay, so that's that's a really interesting question. I, one of the things that you have to do is that there's gotta be an offering. In most cases, a, a, a DMV or a governmental agency is sending out an RFI, a request for information, or an RFP, um, a request for product or something along those lines, and you respond to it. In our case, we were different because we had something that we wanted to introduce. So we had a conversation with the DMV around our product and where we thought it would be beneficial and basically reversed the sales cycle. We basically had the initial conversation. They uh, were able to garner interest because they saw a benefit for having a technology that helped to streamline a lot of their processes. And then we went about you know, working in, in partnership because what you do is that you have to find out what your partner needs. You have to find out what they need and what would be beneficial. So doing that work on the upfront helped us to be able to, you know, work, you know, seamlessly across lines, you know, with the different departments uh, that we work with, whether it's the DMV, uh, Department of Revenue, uh, Secretary of State's office, depending on what stages you're in, kind of across the board. What would you say, I mean, with your product, do, like you said, a lot of these DMVs, they weren't even really knowing that this product was available, right? Because, you know, probably for however long DMVs have been around, they've just been printing license plates on those, you know, metal plates like they do. And you guys have completely flipped that on its head, which is awesome and makes it, you know, more environmentally friendly, makes it a better user experience, make it makes it a lot easier to, you know, renew your registration. I mean, so do you just kind of take a three pronged approach and say, hey, this is going to be better for the environment, make it easier for the users? I mean, what, what does that, you know, kind of look like for, for your sales team? Well, it's, it's, it's different because um, we go to where they are. So there are conferences that you can attend that will give you access to people who are making those decisions. So that's important. Know, know where your audience is. Also, you know, work in conjunction with, you know, the folks who set standards for, you know, the areas that you're in. Uh, that is, that's important. And then, you know, make sure that your product actually does what it says it's going to do. So you, you do your research, find out what the needs are. A lot of these uh, DMVs or Department of Revenues or Secretary of State's offices, whichever uh, they have uh, their um, Department of, of, of Motor Vehicles in, um, will be modernizing their systems. And if that's the case, then there are ways that you can connect through APIs and other things like that. So we just do a lot of research you know, on the upfront to make sure that when we're contacting people, that we're showing a, a compelling use case as to why they would want to engage with us. Makes sense, makes sense. As we wrap up here, the question I ask every guest is, what is one question that I didn't ask you that I wished I asked and, and then have you answer it? So I don't know if there's a question that comes to mind around your business or customer service or what you know excites you this year, but it's, uh, it's, it's you know all up to you. No, I, I'll say this. I, I don't think that uh, state governments um, get enough credit for being proactive. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, my big thing is, is, is about looking at it as a, a true public-private partnership. Mm -hmm. You can be in partnership with state government. You don't have to be afraid of, you know, going through the process. I think that there is a lot to be gained by having a fair exchange of ideas and information. Right. and then looking at ways to improve the process so the customer at the end of the day gets a better experience. And I think, you know, with the states that we've been able to work with, that is one thing is that we've entered into a real partnership about how to improve the process and make it easier. Uh, as uh, Bernard Soriano said from the California DMV, it's no longer your dad's or mom's DMV. You know, we're looking at technology differently. So I think that that's part of what you do is that you work in conjunction at, in as a partnership to make that happen. 
And, and you didn't sense. ask that question. No, but I mean, it's, it's a great, great answer. So last three, it's the fast three. Number one, what is your favorite book? That's actually a, a really, really good one. I, I, let me say the, the book that I'm reading now is Th Trillion Dollar Coach. Okay. And it's a story of, uh, of Bill Campbell, who was the one that influenced so many of these huge companies, like from Google mm -hmm. to, um, you know, Facebook, uh, and was able to really help folks uh, realize, you know, the greatness that they had and, 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 and to help direct them mm -hmm. in a unique way to understand what they could build. Cool. That's awesome. Number two, favorite blog. Okay. I don't know if I have a favorite blog, but I have a favorite podcast okay. and it is, um, and it's grit, uh, Jubin, uh, from Kleiner Perkins does it. And I absolutely love the podcast. Uh, uh, so yeah, so that's cool. Not a, not a blog podcast. Oh. And last but not least your favorite leader within your industry. Okay. This is an interesting question. And I will say, you know, like one of my first investors and somebody I have a tremendous amount of respect for is a gentleman named John Thompson. Mm -hmm. John was the chairman of Microsoft. Uh, he was CEO of Symantec. And when I was first uh, building the business, um, I met him at an event and basically gave him a, you know, kind of a, a pitch about what we were doing. And he gave me his email address and I emailed him I remember at like five o'clock in the morning and he got back to me like half an hour later. Wow. And for a person that could do anything for him to give me that time was really, really impressive. So when, when I think about business leaders and any time that I ever had a conversation before he gets off the phone, he was like, how can I help? How can I be helpful? Mm -hmm. And that is the mindset and mentality that I think is vitally important. And the most important thing is that how do you help other people get to where they need to be? Totally. And uh, uh, he's, you know, just so impressive and such an amazing person. So I would say John Thompson. That's awesome. That's great. Well, Neville, thank you so much for joining us on Caffeinated. Where can people find you if they want to get in touch? Uh, you can always find me on LinkedIn, uh, Neville Boston, you know, and, um, and I'm always there. So, you know, posting things about the business and what's going on. So, awesome. and then check out www.reviver.com. Awesome. Thank you again for coming on.